Hello, welcome to some selected recordings from the Windows Azure Bootcamp, presented by Intertech. The Windows Azure Bootcamp was originally presented at Microsoft's office in Bloomington, Minnesota on May 25th and 26th. These videos are selected chapters from that material. Original material for the Windows Azure Bootcamp are made available at www.azurebootcamp.com. My name is Jim White, and I'm an instructor and director of training at Intertech. My email address is jwhite at intertech.com. Intertech is a consulting and training company located in the Twin Cities. We're located at www.intertech.com, but you can also follow us and find us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. We're also the home of the Windows Azure User Group, available at www.azureug.net. This is a virtual users group, so come as you are, and we're happy to have you. In this first chapter, we want to introduce you to cloud computing, and more specifically, Microsoft Windows Azure. We'll take a look at exactly what is cloud computing. We'll examine a term used by Microsoft when describing Windows Azure, and that is the cloud operating system. We'll look at some scenarios that might describe your reason for moving applications to the cloud. And of course, we'll explore the cloud from Microsoft's point of view. Specifically, what is Microsoft Windows Azure? And finally, we'll look at the environment, that is the development environment, that's available for developing applications in Windows Azure. Now there are many challenges facing IT organizations today. No surprise to you, I'm sure. Some of these challenges can be addressed in whole or part by cloud computing. Rising infrastructure costs. Most organizations have a data center in place today. The cost for those servers, networks, all part of those data centers continues to rise. And like a house, they always need to be upgraded and maintained. Organizations are looking for ways to shed some of those capital costs and expenditures and turn them into more manageable operational expenditures. In other words, CapEx versus OpEx. Organizations also have a tough time leveraging past investments in IT. Think about how your organization is managed or migrated through various technologies. For example, from mainframe to client server development, maybe with something like Power Builder to maybe .NET today. How often were you able to leverage past investments, past experiences in the new realm? In moving to the cloud, we hope to leverage our current .NET ASP experience, for example, and also help try to keep a lid on some of those costs again. Data centers are typically pretty crowded places with many physical limits on what they can support. Once a capacity, the only answer is usually another bigger data center, and of course, the expense that goes with it. Is there a way for us to reduce the burden on data centers in a cost-effective way? And of course, again, the answer is yes, possibly through the cloud. Spikes in demand, for example, websites, as an example, can cause real headaches in outfitting our data centers. We often have to have a large overcapacity to meet the few large spikes the website receives over a year. For example, Domino's Pizza often experiences a 50% spike on their website on Super Bowl Sunday. How do they meet the demand without an extra large and unused capacity the rest of the year? And the answer, of course, is the cloud. Of course, security, be it physical or information security, is always a concern made more complex by demands for greater transparency, greater access, either on the part of external clients and organizations or even internally. For these and many other reasons, organizations are looking to the cloud for help. Now, with regard to capacity that I mentioned, most organizations have to continue to expand the capacity in a block-by-block -block fashion. That is, continuing to put a new set of servers and bandwidth in place to support a larger and larger demand. 
This results in two problems. First, waste. When a new block is added in anticipation of a load. And second, when there is not enough capacity during spikes. What we often need is a model that's a little bit more flexible. The cloud offers that flexibility. I like to call the cloud the Goldilocks approach to capacity. Not too much, not too little, just right. Now I should mention that with regard to Microsoft's Windows Azure, we'll find that it can help do this, but to be fair, the capacity line here wouldn't exactly be this neat. Azure today provides no auto sensing capability to automatically grow and shrink as needed. The Azure model provides a faster and easier means to bring up or take down capacity, but it's still largely at your discretion. Is there a paradigm, an analogy we can use to understand how cloud computing might be able to help IT today? Well, electricity generation at the turn of the century, and by that I mean the last century, was an individual enterprise affair. Each company, say a hotel for example, had to generate their own electricity. Each had their own dynamo and electricity generating managing apparatus. Over time, other organizations began to sell and buy spare capacity from other companies until eventually companies grew up solely to produce and share that electricity. So computing power is at a point where we can start to draw some parallels. Today our organizations each have to have the infrastructure necessary to produce their computing power. Occasionally, some of us buy or share that excess computing power to others. Tomorrow, we might all be able to purchase the computing power we need from a utility organization, a utility computing service, if you will. And that utility service is what the cloud aims to be or provide. Use of the electrical grid analogy has to be done with some care. ACM recently did a series of articles on cloud computing. One article was quick to point out the analogy has some shortcomings in that the computing grid, if we can call it that, has to overcome a number of additional challenges that the electrical grid did not. Namely, we have things like security concerns that the electrical grid didn't have to worry about. We have pace of innovation. Moore's law applies to our computing world, and there is no real parallel in electrical technology. And then we have limits to how much you can scale computational services. Latency around the world, especially given the speed of light and other concerns, all lead us to be a little bit cautious about using directly this electrical grid analogy when we think about cloud computing. So many look to the cloud today to address the many challenges facing IT. In general, they come down to a few key factors or reasons. We want to be able to save money based on a pay-as-you-go service that does not require a huge infrastructure investment. Or, you want to approve your abilities. For example, think about the last time you set out to build a new application. How much time and effort was used just to get your development infrastructure up in place? These kinds of concerns certainly make using or thinking about using the cloud an advantage. So when we look for a definition of what is cloud computing, one way to look at it, quite simply, is a place to run your code. And it's a place to run your code to either save or make us money, or again, increase or improve our abilities. Again, things like scalability, marketability, our time to market. Recognize when we're talking about cloud computing, there are at least three different types or forms of cloud computing. Infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. Infrastructure as a service is essentially a data center. All the hardware and software necessary to host your applications and data. Flexscale and Amazon Web Services are two often cited examples of IaaS. Platform as a service, PaaS, is essentially IaaS++. In other words, a data center, all the hardware and software necessary to host your applications and data, plus a set of tools and an API in support of cloud-based application development. This is where Windows Azure comes in. 
Google App Engine is another example of PAAS. And then there's Software as a Service, SAAS. Package commercial software available over the internet in a pay-as-you-go model. Salesforce.com is the most often cited example of SAAS. Now let's switch our attention to Windows Azure. Windows Azure is actually a set of cloud technologies, each providing a set of services to application developers. We have Windows Azure itself. This is a Windows-based environment for running applications and storing persistent data on servers in Microsoft data centers. Your applications will actually reside in what's called the compute portion of Windows Azure. The data in storage. Now this storage is not SQL Server, not a relational database. We'll find in a little bit about the three different types of storage provided by Windows Azure. We also have SQL Azure. This is SQL Server running in the cloud. Or what we probably should say is almost SQL Server running in the cloud. In other words, this is SQL Server but with some limitations. So it is a relational database, but not quite the same SQL Server 2008 you might find in your data centers. Lastly, we have Windows Azure App Fabric. App Fabric today provides two capabilities, or if you will, two functions. One is access control, if you will, security. And the other, a service bus, to provide connectivity either between applications in Azure environments or between applications that run on-premise or between applications in the cloud and on-premise. So Windows Azure is the hosting environment for your cloud-based services. A large group of machines, each potentially running a number of virtual machines, uh, with switches, load balancer, and more running in Microsoft data centers make up what is called the fabric. The Fabric provides your virtualized computation and storage platform. Computation will be in the form of two different types of applications or roles that you create, either web or worker roles. These will be described momentarily. Storage of data is in the form of blobs, tables, and queues. More on these also in a bit. Now the Fabric and the applications and data that reside in it are monitored and controlled by the Fabric Controller. The Fabric Controller is the automated service management system that handles provisioning, geo distribution, and the entire life cycle of cloud based services. In essence, the Fabric Controller acts as a kernel that you'd see in any other desktop OS. It communicates with a fabric agent running on each machine and is also aware of every application and the storage, which by the way it just sees as another application in running in the fabric. It monitors running applications, manages the OS, for example taking care of patches, decides where applications should run, trying to optimize hardware utilization, performs recovery, whenever one of the systems fails and does much much more. And by the way, if you're interested, each virtual machine running in the fabric runs Windows Server 2008 Enterprise 64 along with a modified version of Hyper-V. With regard to computation, again you'll create applications that consist of web, and worker roles. For scalability, you will dictate to the Azure cloud environment how many copies or instances of each role you want to exist. Each instance runs on its own virtual machine within the fabric. For those roles that are exposed to outside traffic, web roles as shown here, for example, Azure also provides a load balancer to help spread the traffic amongst the instances that are running. And this is done automatically. Thus, Azure provides increased scalability by just dictating more instances of your compute roles. 
Again, there are two types of roles. Web roles, which typically provide the interface to end users. These are ASP.NET applications, in typical cases, that handle HTTP and HTTPS requests from users. By the way, to support this web role running on virtual machines in the cloud, each virtual machine that supports a web role includes IIS 7. Web roles should be stateless. In other words, any data that the web role needs should be stored in Azure Storage, which again includes tables, queues, and blobs. Worker roles, on the other hand, are not typically end-user exposed. In fact, worker role instances initiate their own request for input. It can read messages from a queue, for example, or it can't open connections with the outside world. Those roles, or I should say worker roles, do the data crunching work behind the scenes. In essence, worker roles are similar in nature to batch jobs or Windows services. While they can be communicated with directly, a good practice is to communicate with worker roles via that message queue again. Worker roles, in fact, are often set up to monitor the queue and to take their instructions from messages left in that queue. You can have as many web or worker roles as you desire in your Azure applications. Often the two types of roles work together to provide an entire application. Web roles communicate with the end user and queue up work for worker roles that process the request and then manage the data in the background. Azure provides, again, three forms of data storage, blobs, queues, and table. This, again, is not relational data storage. In general, this storage is for keeping application state. It can be utilized by applications both in and outside of the cloud. Regardless of how it is stored, again, whether it be blobs, tables, or queues, all the data in Windows Azure Storage is replicated three times. This replication provides that fault tolerance. Each replicate is also on a different server. So all three Windows Azure Storage styles, again, blobs, queues, tables, use the conventions of REST, the REST API, to store, modify, and retrieve data. However, an Azure Storage Client API that uses ADO.NET data services and link can also be used by net, .NET applications. Here are some uh, pictures of one of the uh, Microsoft data centers. In particular, this is an overhead shot of the data center located in Chicago. And here is inside that data center a uh, picture of the containers, truck containers, that actually house oh, anywhere from around 1,800 to 20, I think 2,500 uh, computers each that run our Azure environment. Each of those containers is provided with its own heating, cooling, electricity that's just jacked in to the resources available inside uh, the computing center. Now when it comes to data centers, there's actually four different generations of data centers that Microsoft has identified. Generation 1, their first data centers are just typical data centers that you might find in your operation. Uh, and nothing really special about them other, other than the fact that they are large and obviously provide for our uh, environment, our Azure environment. Generation 2 tried to reduce a lot of the operational costs, particularly paying attention to things like heating and cooling and electricity to so try and optimize that for the large data centers to come. And Generation 3, which uh, Chicago being the first of Generation 3 data centers, is a total containerized server environment. And by that I mean the warehouse essentially holds a set of truck trailers. Each truck contains 1,800 to 25 servers as I mentioned before. There's a video at the link you see here on the screen which describes that uh, and shows you some pictures of that particular type of data center. And lastly is generation four. Uh, these are to be built but according to um, speculation and information on the web you'll see uh, one is uh, being built in or at least supposedly being built in Europe and there's a YouTube video out there, an animation of what Generation 4 data centers are going to look like. These are going to be massive data centers, roofless. The entire center is essentially a grassy field filled with these um, trailer trailers, I should say truck trailers, that provide our computing environment. Microsoft often refers to Windows Azure as the operating system for the cloud. Exactly what does that mean? Well, let's look at what exactly does an operating system do. 
say an operating system on our as our Windows 7 or Windows Vista operating system does on our desktop. Essentially an operating system helps abstract away the details of our hardware. For example, Windows 7 or Vista provides file management, security, task scheduling, and abstracting away all the details of access to memory and CPU and disk. That's what an operating system does for us on our desktop. And essentially, that's exactly the thing that Azure does for us in the cloud. Instead of abstracting away the details of our individual PC or individual desktop, the Azure operating system abstracts away the details of what is the fabric and the data centers that Microsoft provides. So it provides a set of APIs, a set of controllers to help manage our applications inside of that cloud. So Windows Azure is a collection of data centers, each running a collection of commodity hardware the fabric. Some servers in that fabric provide for computation. Others provide for data storage. The fabric controller serves as the brains of that data center and of that fabric, managing the hardware and the applications that run on it. Your cloud application, called a service, in the form of web and worker roles, runs on that fabric and its data is stored in the storage in triplicate. Requests for your service are distributed by an Azure load balancer, which again is managed and configured by the Fabric Controller. By the way, Microsoft also provided a web portal and management API for deploying and managing your applications and data in the cloud. So your service actually consists of two parts, as far as the cloud is concerned, that is, the service and the model. The service is your app Azure application code that you want running in the cloud. And the model is essentially configuration information that you provide to the Fabric Controller that dictates how you want your service deployed and operating within the cloud. For example, it helps dictate the number of instances you want running of your service. You deploy your application, both the service and the model, through the web portal or a service management API. The Fabric Controller is given the model and uses it to determine how to get your service into the fabric. The service is deployed to that fabric. The fabric control is also using your model to set up appropriate DNS entries and configuring load balancing for your service. Now I mentioned Azure and the cloud helps provide scalability. How does it do this? Well, your application starts to I should say, if your application starts to see a large demand, you use the web portal or service management API to tell the Fabric Controller to provide more instances of your application in that fabric. Then, as demand weakens, you use that same portal or API to have the controller remove instances from the fabric. So you get capacity on demand as you need it, helping to eliminate or at least greatly reduce excess capacity or not enough capacity. Again, that fabric controller serves as the brains behind Windows Azure. As such, it also helps to monitor and provide recovery of your service in the fabric. So say for example, your service is running in the fabric, but one of the instances develops some sort of issues and goes down. The fabric controller deter uh, detects this, and once it detects it, brings another instance of your service back online. Of course, this is all done automatically. So what does Windows Azure cost? Well, for a complete picture, I encourage you to take a look at the Azure Return on Investment and Total Cost of Ownership Calculator located at the URL you see on the screen. But to give you some ballparks, let's take a look at, first of all, compute. Those virtual machines that run your worker and web roles. The cost for the smallest uh, virtual machines, that is one CPU and 1.6 seven gigabytes of memory cost 12 cents an hour. When you move up to an extra large instance, we're talking about 96 cents an hour. So as you can see, based on the size of the virtual machine instance you need, the costs are linear. Storage, blob, queue, and tables are priced per gigabyte. And we start at 15 cents 
at a gigabyte per month. One thing to remember is that transactions are also charged. So per 10,000 transactions into and out of that data storage, you're talking about an additional cent. And we also have to deal with bandwidth, that is the amount of information ingress and egress to and from the applications. And that's based on 10 cents in and 15 cents out per gigabyte. So relatively reasonable cost. So you have a pay-as-you-go type of platform to support your applications in the cloud. Pretty low cost barrier of entry. And for those of you who do more work in the cloud, there are subscription discounts. And coming sometime in the near future are volume licensing discounts not yet available through Microsoft. You also want to take a look at the Windows Azure Service Guarantee, the SLA. Today, service guarantee is for 99.95% uptime. By the way, this is the same as you'll find in Amazon's EC2 environment. And lastly, before we leave this chapter, let's talk about, as a developer, what tools do you need and work with to develop applications for the cloud. Well, the good news is you will typically write applications for Azure using good old-fashioned Windows Visual Studio. You'll need 2008 or 2010. And this must be run as admin. Why? Well, the administrator privileges allow the dev fabric to be spun up. Otherwise, the dev fabric, which we'll talk about in our next chapter, can't be run. You'll also need to run in either Vista or Windows 7. The reason for this is the need for IIS 7 support. Of course, .NET 3.5 and some local instance of SQL Server, either SQL Express or SQL Server is required. You'll need the Azure SDK. This provides the dev fabric, again something we'll talk about in the next chapter, which essentially is a 90% replicate of what you'll actually see inside of the cloud. A handy mechanism for testing and developing applications, but it also provides a set of templates, that is Visual Studio templates, to build Azure applications. And if you are building to the app fabric, again, ACS or to the service bus provided by app fabric, you'll also need the app fabric SDK. Well, that concludes our first chapter. Return for our next chapter where we talk about the web role and a little bit more about how that dev fabric works.